He is an expert on foreign and security issues in East Asia and China. And this morning, Professor Zhang's talk is entitled, The Era of Mistrust, The Future of Sino-U.S. Relations. Professor Zhang. Um, I do not want to uh, sound alarmist, uh, but uh, I want to emphasize that uh, the recent visit of uh, President Hu Jintao to the United States uh, seemed to have uh, achieved uh, very little. Now, that concerns me uh, a lot. And uh, despite the pomp and the circumstances, all the diplomatic fanfare, uh, it, uh, this visit uh, has served its purpose of uh, temporarily uh, suspending uh, the conflict or the controversy uh, between the two countries. Uh, but uh, I do not see any uh, new breakthroughs. Uh, I do not see any new ground uh, it's broken. Or uh, even worse, I do not even see a new diplomatic uh, framework that has been worked out. Now, American side seem to be happy that they rejected, according to the American source, um, rejected Chinese demand for a, another joint communique. So we end up with a joint statement, which of course is the lowest form. Uh, basically says you can say, you, you can uh, uh, ag uh, agree to disagree, you can state whatever your position uh, are. Now, this is, I think, uh, uh, I consider this visit uh, perhaps it's a, it's a missed opportunity for the two countries to um, establish a foundation for a new beginning, okay, to reset the relationship um, in, the, in the new uh, diplomatic framework. Okay. Now, the, uh, both Washington and Beijing uh, prefer to compare this visit to Deng Xiaoping's visit 30 years ago. Uh, I think it's, this is a wrong comparison. The real comparison should be with uh, Kissinger, Nixon Kissinger visit, uh, where we did achieve a fundamental uh, strategic uh, understanding between China. Now, despite the fact this is a Cold War, there is a Soviet factor, uh, but I think the, uh, uh, the intuitive uh, understanding between uh, leaders of the two countries uh, has not been surpassed since. Now, at this stage, uh, it's a historic moment. Uh, my feeling is that um, uh, the U.S.-China perhaps is heading uh, towards a downward uh, spiral and uh, very difficult to stop, and very difficult to stop. Now, the reason for what I call the era of mistrust between the United States and China is partly to do with the Cold War legacy. The old ideological debate still goes on, but I think even more profound uh, reason is not about communism uh, versus the uh, uh, democracy. It is a much deeper cultural uh, misunderstanding which leads to a consistent misreading of each other's mind. In other words, the problem is there is no meeting of minds uh, between the two countries. Okay. Now, the United States uh, seem to look at this relationship with China uh, from its own historic experience. That is the historic experience, a uh, relatively short one, uh, since the, in the European Enlightenment. Okay, so the U U.S. Uh, still using Enlightenment perspective, uh, still see China from that perspective. Okay. Therefore, the key concepts of the U.S. Uh, policy dealing with China uh, seems to me uh, need to be uh, reassessed. Now, Chinese have a very uh, bad habit of uh, looking back much farther. Um, I, I don't think it's made a headline in, in the world. Um, recently, the Chinese uh, Tiananmen Square uh, allowed Confucius statue to be uh, established uh, just a few weeks ago, which is very controversial even in China, because Tiananmen Square is always occupied by Karl Marx, Engels, 
Lenin, Stalin, occasionally also Sun Yat-sen, the founder of Chinese Republic. Uh, uh, of course, Mao's there forever. Okay. But now they're joined by Confucius. Uh, I think this is something very profound. Okay. That indicates China is rapidly returning to its own roots, its tradition, beyond what Enlightenment ideology can explain. Now, first of all, let's look at one of the key concepts, which I disagree completely. Uh, that is the concept known as the rise of China. Now, that has been very commonly used uh, by scholars, politicians, uh, policymakers, and the media. Okay. Now, the connotation of the concept, the rise of China, uh, is, first of all, this is something new. Uh, China, not too long ago, is still called emerging market, uh, not even considered a state, it's an emerging market, but now it's called emerging power, as if this is something new that's taking place in world history. And uh, second, second meaning, I think, the Western concoction of the rise of China, uh, the connotation would be uh, Ch China finally uh, break away from its own traditional way and begin to embrace Western values, at least in part, okay. the market economy uh, and so on and so forth. So therefore, the logically, uh, would be, the, the, the conclusion would be eventually they would also take in the democracy as well. Yeah. Um, so this, uh, this kind of reading of what's happening in China the last 30 years or so, I think is uh, fundamentally misleading. Um, because it also uh, suggests China is actually at the receiving end of the globalization process. Uh, forgetting the historic fact that China is the, one of the original, uh, 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 the uh, initiators of a global market network. Uh, as, as we know, the first truly global market network is known as the Silk Road which already exist many, many centuries ago. Okay. Um, the other, uh, I think, problem for the rise of China is uh, it, uh, uh, it leads to at least two opposite positions or opinions about the future of China. Okay. There are, I would call, two inevitability theses. One inevitability thesis is as China began to embrace Western values gradually, it will end up, inevitably end up in the global uh, network of uh, democratic states. It will integrate, in other words, into a democratic society, uh, the world society in, in the future. Okay. This is the thesis, uh, I think is more uh, popular uh, among those who are dealing with China uh, in economic issues and uh, as well as uh, uh, policy makers uh, uh, such as uh, Robert Zulick who initiated that concept of responsible stakeholder in uh, 2005 and uh, more recently of course the concept of uh, G2. The opposite view also uh, emerged uh, mostly represented by the neoconservatives who have been arguing for many, many years. Uh, neocons are down, but not out. Uh, we are seeing a lot of democratic neocons these days uh, in the Obama administration. That is emphasizing on the inevitability of China will uh, follow the footsteps of previous great powers when they are in the process of rising. Yeah. Therefore, the historic analogy would be Imperial Germany, Kaiser Germany. It's the most popular analogy. Yeah. I think these concepts uh, have not worked, uh, have not uh, reflect reality of China 
And uh, when Americans, uh, when we look at, uh, these, these are not academic issues, I think. When you see Americans made so many proposals since, at least since the, uh, the, uh, the end of Cold War, the grand concepts about how to, engage in, uh, how to engage China. None of them seem to have worked so far. Okay. Now, Responsible Stakeholder by Robert Zolik initially was welcomed by the Chinese, even President Hu Jintao himself, for a moment, a very a much taken away by that concept. Um, because that concept is um, it's, it's an official American response to the Hu Jintao's concept of uh, peaceful rise of China. Okay. But very quickly, the Chinese uh, began to have second thought uh, because they began to realize this is a language of casino. Uh, basically, it says uh, we, the United States, still own the casino, but we are now willing to give you a high table to play. Uh, so you better follow the rules. You see, the, the idea is <laughs> you have to follow the rules. The rules are set uh, not by China. Okay. So peaceful rise, together with the responsible stakeholder, were, were killed at the same time. About a year later, uh, we don't see Chinese using that concept at all. Okay. Um, then we have G2 uh, coming uh, into being uh, around the time 2008. Uh, well. Before that, we have Fred Bergsten, the Peterson Institute, then uh, who is talking about the financial interdependence between China and the United States. Um, uh, the argument for, 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 for uh, Bergsten is that um, we better engage China, uh, elevate China's position now uh, before it become more powerful. But unfortunately, of course, financial crisis came much sooner than everybody else thought. Uh, um, then uh, speak Brzezinski, also uh, publicly as an advisor to the President Obama campaign, during the campaign, uh, publicly announced a, a G2 concept. And um, Brzezinski even tried in Beijing. Um, well, he told me that uh, he, you know, he said at the beginning, uh, at the end of his speech about G2, the Chinese have a standing ovation. <laughs> it's very excited. Then again, Chinese began to have second thought about this concept. Um, when President Obama visited China in November that year, uh, the, on the first day, President Hu Jintao was too polite, very Chinese way, never mentioned G2, but, but he let uh, Prime Minister Wen Jiabao the second day talking to Obama. The first thing he said is, we don't like G2. Uh, we are not forgetting about the Europeans okay. and the others. Okay. So these concepts uh, are based on the idea, American understanding of the rise of China. Uh, Beijing consensus, you know, all, the, all these arguments are all based on the concept. Now, the, the, the recent book by Stefan Halper, which is a very popular book, they're basically saying Chinese is anti-enlightenment, which I think he's right to say that. The Chinese remember uh, Renaissance humanism much better than they remember uh, enlightenment. En enlightenment for Chinese is a counter-revolution uh, as to uh, the Renaissance humanism in terms of uh, uh, the Western dealing with the different culture in the world. Now, that thesis it's already uh, been uh, supported by a, 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 a very important school of uh, uh, studies in, at Cambridge. This is known as Cambridge School, led by Professor Quentin Skinner and many others uh, to explain why Enlightenment uh, actually destroyed the chances of accommodation, integration between East and West. Now, here I'm particularly talking about between China and Europe. Yeah. Now, from Chinese perspective, we, when we look at this uh, rise of China, of course, we tend to uh, uh, 
uh, laugh at that notion. Uh, I think the leadership uh, no longer use that concept, as you know. Um, Chinese are using the concept restoration, or maybe even re-rise. This is not something we have not seen before. You think about the trade surplus. Now, China never had a trade deficit in history, most of the history till 19th century. The accumulation of enormous amount of world hard currency, which has been the norm. Now, in 19th century, China basically sucked in the whole world silver. Now, those days, hard currency is silver. That's, you know, eventually this is what the Im global imbalance, uh, what the, in, in today's language, uh, led to the British decision to initiate a war with China in, in, in the uh, 1840s, the open war. Okay. So this is, and also by 1820s, the Chinese uh, uh, share of global GDP, according to OECD study uh, of a long history, the long uh, economic history, it's about 30 to 32 okay. percent. Now today, despite all the outcry, the, the um, whatever sentiment associated with the yellow peril or <laughs> whatever uh, that is, uh, Chinese economy is about 6 percent of the global share. Okay. So in other words, uh, I think the Chinese leaders and the Chinese elite and the people uh, began now intuitively uh, the, the process of looking back at his own roots. The argument that Chinese political system is a hindrance to Chinese economic development uh, has not been proven by China's long historic experience. So therefore, the issue whether China is going to join the family of democracies uh, at this stage is rather a naive one, a rather naive one. Okay. So, so based on these fundamental uh, differences in their perspective uh, about what China's uh, position today, uh, it's very difficult for the two countries to uh, accommodate each other's needs. What we might see um, with this, if this kind of mentality continues on both sides, um, what might lead to is not so much a new China-Soviet, uh, the uh, U.S.-Soviet confrontation like during the Cold War, uh, not even a Franco-German confrontation uh, in Europe. Uh, but a uh, more likely result of the continued misreading of each other's mind uh, would be uh, the Anglo-German alienation before the First World War. Yeah. I, um, I, 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 I was the first uh, who wrote about that uh, almost 10 years ago, <laughs> shortly after George Bush came to power. Um, I think Henry Kissinger agreed with me, <laughs> at least last year in Geneva, uh, he made a, a very sensational speech. He stated exactly the same thesis. That is a misunderstanding not necessarily based on the conflict of hard interest. Because the United States and China have so much common interest. Uh, I'm, not in, you know, uh, ha I'm not having enough time to explain. We have all other experts explain economic, microeconomic issues, many other issues. And uh, also global governance, many other issues. It's very much like uh, the British and the Germans. The Germans are never interested in colonial ad adventure. Therefore, it's never going to be a threat to the British Empire. Um, but they end up the deadly enemies during the First World War because of this kind of mismanagement of the relationship, misreading each other's mind. They usually, the both sides, they, they offer things to the other side the other side do not really need, such as G2 <laughs> uh, or many other things, uh, and ask for something uh, yourself not necessarily need. It's not really the life and death issue. Uh, it, I'm sure even American economic policymakers realize that uh, 
even if Chinese appreciate RMB 25%, it's not going to create millions of jobs or double Obama's you know, job mission. Uh, that's not going to happen. The, uh, the single-minded uh, 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 interpretation of global imbalance, uh, so-called uh, spending glut versus saving glut thesis uh, makes no sense, in my view. Or at least it's not uh, describing the whole story. Okay. To place China in a position for, uh, bl for the blame, for subprime, for Madoff, uh, that's a little bit far-fetched. A little bit far-fetched. Okay. So I think this is, I think it's, um, uh, uh, we are in a very difficult situation here. Because neither side uh, so far seem to be willing to engage on the high strategic level of, of building a real trust. Therefore, we see the naval problems in the, in the Pacific. Uh, I think Ambassador uh, Freeman explained so clear yesterday about South China Sea and uh, many other issues. The Sankaku, I, I don't have to repeat. <laughs> I couldn't explain better than uh, he did. Uh, but now it seemed to be a, a genuine possibility of a confrontation. Okay. As just like the Germans in the late 19th century suddenly offered the British, uh, saying, we help you to protect the colonial possessions. And the British reaction immediately would be, uh, you want to take over <laughs> uh, my uh, uh, part of the empire. Okay. So that's one of the reasons British eventually joined uh, the Entente uh, Cotillard. So I think this is, um, there are a lot of issues that could lead to misunderstanding if the leadership only uh, manage this relationship on ad hoc basis uh, with a short term vision. I understand this time to serve the purpose, the whose visit serve the purpose precisely because both mandates are expiring at the same time, almost at the same time, uh, their, their political mandate. So they need to stabilize for the moment, at least for two years, I would argue, the relationship, but it did not solve any problems. The Taiwan issue, the arms sales, uh, the, the military issues, economic issues. Uh, so I think this is, um, uh, I, I think uh, at this stage, I think this, if they miss this opportunity, uh, I think this is going to, very, uh, going to be very hard uh, to make up the time when the second round of confrontation comes which I don't think is going to be a very long insight. Okay. So what, what would be the solution? Uh, or what would be the proposal I would make here to, to make things uh, uh, better? I think the fundamental issue is, again, start real engagement. Start real dialogue. Okay. I understand the you know, uh, Renaissance humanisms before it's a prehistory for American Republic. Uh, Americans have very little memory about how Europeans engaged China uh, 400 years ago. You see, my argument is we need to go back to the original debate. This is a debate when the Europeans first encountered China. All the issues they raised are the fundamental issues are still very much relevant to the issues today. This is known as a China rise controversy uh, 400 years ago, triggered by the Jesuit missionaries. Okay. Uh, So-called China rise controversy uh, seemed to be talking about obscure religious theological issues. You see, the issue at that time is Confucianism fit in with Catholic universalism or compatible. Okay. Uh, Chinese ancestor worship, which is our tradition, does it conflict with the Christian tenet? See, these are the issues at the time. Okay. But if you translate into modern language, the issues is more or less the same. Okay. Now, the Jesuits' brilliance is they believe, led by Father Matteo Ricci, um, his view is the Chinese Confucian value system is very close to Christian system. But therefore, we don't have to uh, force Chinese 
even though they want, you know, if for the Chinese who want to convert into Christianity uh, to abandon their own culture. This is known as an accommodationist approach. But unfortunately, this particular controversy was drawn into European power politics. As we know, this controversy involved uh, three popes, two Chinese emperors, hundreds of missionaries, and the entire uh, theology faculty of Sorbonne. <laughs> and it lasted several hundred years. Uh, has not been solved until 1943. Um, so, you know, Catholic, Catholic mission was almost killed by the controversy because Pope's verdict based on European politics, nothing to do with China at the time. The verdict is no. No Chinese can become Christian if they don't uh, follow the, you know, the strict, uh, if they continue to ad adhere to the Chinese traditional uh, way, uh, rites, the, the rituals. Now, this is the debate I think the Chinese would like to restart. Okay. China has its own history of domestic governance, has nothing to do with communism. Uh, the Confucian way of governance is based on politics as virtue, and the people have rights to rebel against the bad government. Contrary to, to the common belief, Confucianism is a conservative uh, political philosophy. Now, don't forget the Confucian uh, famous uh, Quote, uh, the, the relationship between government and people is a water and a boat. A water can carry the boat, can f let the boat flow, but can also over overturn the boat. Uh, if the bad, this is the political history of China, the constant peasant rebellion against the bad government uh, for a real regime changes. Uh, has been a part of the con Confucian, uh, authorized by Confucian ethics. Now, this is where the Chinese leadership is really concerned. I, I, I will say, to put China in the category of imperial Germany, uh, it uh, uh, indicates total ignorance of uh, Chinese history. China has no colonial expansionist history. China used to have the world number one navy. Uh, we travel as far as Madagascar, Africa, <laughs> anywhere uh, they can reach. Uh, what this navy brought back, giraffes, a uh, couple of black chieftains who were too slow to greet the Chinese fleet, uh, some precious stones. Now, Professor uh, Paul Kennedy, Yale University, uh, had the famous book, uh, Rise for China. He asked the question, what if? What if Chinese had the same mentality as Europeans at the time? Of course, we don't see uh, your empires, <laughs> we're seeing the Chinese uh, had empire a long time ago, before everybody else. Yeah. So I think the, uh, uh, to base a security policy, military policy on China threat uh, is uh, off base. Now, having said that, I'm not trying to say uh, defending the Chinese regime uh, for its own mistakes. For example, uh, for South China Sea last year, I think uh, a Chinese, uh, a key foreign policy maker, uh, made a huge mistake by using the concept core interests to cover the controversial territorial disputes. Now, you can cover Taiwan, Tibet, other issues, but you, you cannot cover South China Sea, Sankaku, and the other disputed territory. Now, th this is a big mistake, which provides the American uh, military hawks, in particular, was a great opportunity of re-enter you know, Asia with a grand style of building a, a what they call a mini-lateral uh, alliance uh, uh, for uh, some kind of containment uh, around China. Uh, that's a, that's a, uh, admittedly it's a success of, uh, of the US policy of uh, regroup these uh, Southeast Asian, Japan, and South Korea. But the foundation of that, uh, the, 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 ba ba the basic principle of that uh, policy, it's, it's not a correct one. Okay. I don't think Chinese are uh, really uh, interested uh, in uh, future territorial expansion.
they have too many domestic problems. Uh, they probably are not even able to handle. Uh, after 30 years reform, as we know, the social tension in China is so high, uh, it's beyond the power of uh, Western economics to explain. Okay. Um, China's GDP become number two means very little for Chinese. Per capita is 100, it's at the same level as Iraq. Uh, so it's not, uh, I, I don't think it's, you know. And of course, the official corruption, it's widespread, which directly undermined political legitimacy. It's now reaching a very dangerous point. The Gini index, uh, even Chinese press admit it's the highest in the world, meaning the gap between rich and poor has a lot to do, not just uh, uh, injustice, uh, bad income distribution, but also has to do with the, uh, the official corruption. Uh, about 5% of the population owns uh, almost 90% of national wealth. Now, this is against communist principle as well as against Confucian principle. The regime is really under, under siege. It's too busy dealing with these issues, social unrest, single spark can start a prairie fire, to use Mao's original expression. This is the common language when you talk to Chinese elite, if they trust you enough. They know this is what the situation is. Okay. China GDP, just I, I finish with another mi misunderstanding about China growth. The red line of Chinese GDP growth is 6%. Below that, most Political elite, economic elite, central bankers I'm talking to, they, they all recognize that red line. We're talking about major social unrest, below 6%. So there are enormous problems in hands to deal with. I very much doubt they're going to go for uh, Kaiser German uh, uh, policy at all. So this is, I think, uh, I, by, uh, by conclusion, I say we, you know, we need to start a fresh new debate beyond the Enlightenment. Go back to Renaissance humanism, who are willing to accommodate some basic traditional values of China. And uh, I would argue that the United States policy, if you really want the, the policy to work, is to encourage China to go back to its traditional rules as fast as, po as possible. Uh, rather than pushing them towards a modern state concept of uh, uh, political uh, democracy. Thank you very much.